Another trade deadline is in the books, and we have a ton of trades to talk about. Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, August 2nd. Frank Sample joined by Scott White here to recap all of the trades that went down after the Juan Soto deal. That's basically where we left off with our emergency podcast earlier on Tuesday. Scotty, how are we doing? Did you make it through the deadline in one piece? <laughs> I did. It was busy. It wasn't quite 2021 busy because that was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but uh, I am still, I'm still here, Frank. I'm still living and breathing and ready to break down these trades one more time in oral form after already doing so in written form. All right, so there you go. He's got all the wheels already turning. You got all the thoughts that you want to get out there, and we'll do that in just a second for this podcast. You know, we'll try and keep it 30 minutes or less, and then, of course, we'll be back again later on Tuesday night to recap all of Tuesday's action, but we didn't really want to save all these deals for then because then we wouldn't actually talk about anything that happened on Tuesday. So instead, we'll just give you another bonus podcast reacting to all these trades, and let's start with Tyler Malley, who is traded to the Minnesota Twins for – Pretty nice package of prospects. Infielder Spencer Steer, infielder Christian Encarnacion, Encarnacion Strand, someone I know we talked about recently on FBT and Five, and a left-handed pitcher in Steven Hajar. And uh, look, for Tyler Malley, Scott, this is a huge park shift upgrade. His home road splits, 4.76 ERA in Great American Ballpark, 3.83 ERA. This has me thinking that he's a borderline top 40 starting pitcher rest of season. What do you think about that? I I think he could threaten top 30 status, to be honest, because, I mean, so what did you give the career splits home away or just this year's? Yeah, that's career. Career, okay. So pretty significant between the home and road ERA. What's even more significant for Tyler Malley's career, which has been entirely in Cincinnati, it's worth pointing out, is the the home run rate, home runs per nine innings. His career at home, 1.9. That's really, really bad. His career home run per nine on the road, 0 0.8. That's really, really good. Opposite end of the spectrum. And it makes sense that he'd be so homer prone in a small venue like Great American Ballpark because he's a fly ball pitcher. Uh, but it seems like his fly balls are potentially... Uh, just the right, uh, you know, they're, they're just of the, of the right distance that a, a shift from a smaller park like Great American Ballpark to a more neutral, maybe slightly more pitcher-leaning venue like Target Field could be pretty transformative for Tyler Malley, who's, who we already think of as, what, a top 60 pitcher? And, you know, really, he's been more than that since uh, since the end of May over his last nine starts. Tyler Malley, a 283 ERA, 105 whip, 10K per nine. Uh, yeah, things things only get to stand to get better with the Twins. And uh, I'd be looking to buy on him if I could right now in fantasy. All right. And Tyler Malley, obviously moving from the National League to the American League, will be available in AL only leagues. So if you saved your fab for this deadline, uh, Tyler Malley is probably someone you want to go out there and pretty much spend the rest of it on if you play in AL only. It's got this prospect hall here, Spencer Steer, Christian Encarnacion Strand, and left-handed pitcher Steve Hajar. Of the three, Steer, I think, could actually make a difference, could make an impact this season in fantasy because he has played 48 games at AAA and pretty good numbers, 269 batting average, 20 homers, 889 OPS. What do you think about Spencer Steer? Yeah, and for as much power as he offers... Uh, you know, 43 extra, actually 45 extra base hits in 83 games. The strikeout rate is, is low. It's, he's not, uh, he's not one of those boppers who, you know, is gonna, is gonna bury himself with strikeouts. Now he is hitting only 269. So it may be a situation where despite the low strikeout route rate, he's not going to be able to be particularly useful in batting average. He gets a lot of fly ball outs and such, but he's a versatile player. Uh, he's 24 years old. And as you said, already seems to have mastered the upper minors. It, it wouldn't surprise me if the Reds had a need for him before the season is done. It also wouldn't surprise me if they just wanted to keep his arbitration clock from starting. But yeah, Spencer Steer, name to know in Dynasty especially. 
All right, let's move on to the next trade. Whit Merrifield traded to the Toronto Blue Jays for Samad Taylor and Max Castillo. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, Whit Merrifield, obviously down season, 240 batting average, six homers, 15 steals, has been better since the start of May. Merrifield is unvaccinated too. I haven't seen an update this uh, on this, but I assume if he was traded to the Blue Jays, he might have agreed to some kind of vaccination status. I would hope so. Yeah. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know why you'd make that trade as the Blue Jays if if you you weren't sure he was going to get vaccinated. Yeah. Uh, but Scott, talk to me about Whit Merrifield's value with the Blue Jays and who might be filling in for him in Kansas City because I know that they have a very interesting second base prospect there as well. Yeah, they do. Uh, I'll start with that. We actually saw Michael Massey couple weeks ago he, he was one of the players the royals called up ironically because they were in toronto and whit merrifield wasn't vaccinated so they needed somebody to replace him played three games uh he's not young he's 24 years old is michael massey and between double and triple a this year has hit 312 with 16 homers 13 steals a 903 ops and he kind of first emerged on my radar last year had had big numbers in the lower minors kind of old for the level his pro career was delayed by back issues and so that's why um there's the appearance that he's come out of nowhere but the royals have been really high on michael massey for a long time i've heard that internally they've compared him to chase utley which is an unfair comparison and probably one he's not going to live up to but it just shows that you know that this is a legitimate prospect here even though you probably haven't seen him on too many prospect rankings and it sounds like yes he will be getting the call to replace Maryfield as for Maryfield himself i'm a little concerned about what this means it is a better park it is a better lineup it's a pretty crowded situation santiago espinal you, you put his and Maryfield's numbers side by side of course we like Maryfield in fantasy for the stolen bases but uh, you know, you look at the other numbers, the ones that a team like the Blue Jays would care about more, they're not so different. I mean, Merrifield actually has a negative war this year, according to baseball reference. Now, a lot of that probably has to do with the slow start. And, and yeah, he's looked more like uh, the Whit Merrifield we remember over the past two months. And, and maybe the Blue Jays recognize that and are planning to install him as their second baseman. But it wouldn't surprise me if he's not quite a full-time player if uh you know he, he plays more of a utility role maybe getting the majority of the starts at second base but espinal factoring in there too and yeah i don't know that it's going to be like so much of merrifield's value is tied to volume you know so much as fantasy value is and, it, and so if that takes even a little bit of a hit i wonder if i wonder if he's still going to be uh you know like a must-start player in fantasy if we could, could come Potentially even uh, somebody we're not rostering in shallower leagues. Mm. I hear you, Scott, but I, I just can't imagine that the Blue Jays would trade for Merrifield not to play him every day, even if it's you know bouncing around a little bit, second base, a little bit of outfield, whatever it might be. I may, I could be wrong. Well, they, but... they didn't give up that much to get him. That's fair, right? Yeah, it was like some odd Taylor, who's like the fifteenth ranked prospect in the the Blue Jays organization, and Max Castillo. Yeah, and in the past, the, we've always heard the Royals were were holding tight to Whit Merrifield, like they needed to be blown away to trade him. So I, I wonder if we've reached, you know, especially given that he has a negative war this year, I've won, I wonder if we've reached sort of a a breaking point where the league doesn't value him the same as as they had as recently as last year. But I don't know; it remains to be seen. I'm not dumping Whit Merrifield or anything. I I may look to shop him now. Uh, particularly in a, a league where steals are are emphasized if you know if it's a roto league obviously you need to be in a good position for steals to to trade somebody like him but uh if you can get full value for Whit Merrifield you know then obviously that's a that's a no lose situation for you even if he does end up being a full timer for the Blue Jays how about this one Scott trade Whit Merrifield for Tyler Malley eh eh I mean it depends somewhat on need but in a vacuum, I, I would expect Malley to be the more valuable of the two in the second half or over the final two months, I should say. 
All right, let's move over to your Atlanta Braves. They acquired Rysel Iglesias, the former closer for the Angels, in exchange for Jesse Chavez and Tucker Davidson. And look, if you were relying on Iglesias as your first or second closer in a categories league, or I guess even in a points league, this sucks because I do not <laughs> think that he is going to close anymore. Kenley Jansen is the guy. He's been very good for the Braves this season. Now, yeah, Braves do have Iglesias for like the next three years after this, and Kenley Jansen is on a one-year contract. So you know, maybe next year, Rysel Iglesias is the closer for this team, but does not look like it will be the case this year. Yeah, I think that's exactly the incentive for the Braves. They didn't, they didn't give up much of value to get Iglesias. They are paying his full salary for the next three years, and it's about what Kenley Jansen is making this year. So I, I think they were kind of just locking up their closer for the future when Kenley Jansen leaves. And in the meantime, of course, they get to enjoy Rice Iglesias as another late inning leverage guy. I suppose it's possible that he and Jansen split saves in some form or fashion down the stretch, but uh, I'm with you. I, I think I think it's going to remain Jansen's role and uh, – and Iglesias is going to be there to be a setup guy, maybe even a multi-inning setup guy from time to time. His ERA is over four on the year, but he's still, you know, he still looks like a dominant reliever otherwise and expect that number to go down uh, as we, as we finish out the season. Who closes for the angels now that Iglesias is gone? It probably doesn't matter, but the real answer I think is Ryan Tapera, who has been the eighth inning reliever for most of the season. Uh, his numbers are not very good. Not a bunch of strikeouts. Scott, how do you yeah. rank these three? These are kind of like the trade deadline closers who emerged. Ryan Tapera, Rowan Wick, as the Cubs traded both David Robertson, Scott F. Ross, and Michael, and Michael G Givens. Yeah, so Rowan Wick looks like the closer for the Cubs again, and Felix Bautista with the Orioles. How do you rank those three? Bautista looks like he could be... A frontline closer. So I think he's the clear number one. As you say, Ryan Tapera doesn't look like he should be closing, but I do think he's the best the Angels have. So I, I feel pretty confident in him handling that role down the stretch. Rowan Wick, I'm I'm not yeah, yeah, the, the Cubs traded the whole back end of their bullpen. I get that, but Rowan Wick has a 436 ERA, a 173 whip. Maybe the Cubs will turn to him first, but I'm not sure that's going to go well. And it, it wouldn't surprise me if if they were just mixing and matching in the role to close out the season. All right, next up, we have Brandon Drury, who is having a breakout season with the Cincinnati Reds. No more. He was traded to the San Diego Padres. It's just, how many players do you want, Padres? Drury, <laughs> Soto, Josh Bell, Josh Hader, all the players. Anyway, Brandon Drury... As I mentioned, breakout season, 274 batting average, 20 homers. He is a top seven third baseman in both head-to-head -head points and Roto this season. He is the 33rd overall player in Roto categories uh, this year, which is just bananas. He's He's been amazing. The problem, Scott, huge negative park shift from Great American Ballpark, where Drury was hitting 298 with a 915 OPS, now going to Petco, where on the road he's hit 241 with a 771 OPS. Uh, do you agree? Do you think this is a downgrade for Brandon Drury? Yeah, he's definitely one of the stock down players from the trade deadline. You know, he wasn't much of a, a fantasy asset prior to this year, of course, kind of a surprise breakout. And it seems like looking at those home away splits that the venue had quite a bit to do with it. Petco Park, kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from Great American Ballpark. There is possibly a playing time concern here, too, because Drury was playing primarily third base with the Reds. Obviously, that's occupied by Manny Machado. He could play second base, but you got Jake Cronenworth there. I think both Drury and Cronenworth have enough versatility that what what probably will end up happening, uh, since you know Luke Voigt is gone, he was included in that Juan Soto trade. We didn't mention it at the time because that was kind of a later development, but Luke Voigt was included in the Juan Soto trade after Eric Hosmer balked at being included. Hosmer would then move to the Red Sox. So the Padres got rid of two first basemen and got one back, Josh Bell, which means they can now uh, they can now flex their DH spot. So I think Drury and maybe Cronenworth will be used 
to kind of fill in for players around the diamond while those players each get days off at DH. It'll be one of those situations. But I don't think Drury will have a dedicated spot on of his of his own, and that could impact his playing time somewhat. All right. Uh, anything else on this trade? The player that the Reds received in return was shortstop prospect Victor Acosta, an 18-year-old shortstop. Num hasn't played much so far, 32 games at the Arizona Complex League, but uh, the numbers look underwhelming so far. He's he's really yeah. 18. Yeah, I don't have much to say about him. We'll, uh, see we did, what, we'll see what he turns into. We did get this in the chat, and I think it's a fair question, Scott. Jesse Chavez, can he take over as the closer for the Angels? Now, you know, he went over, he went back to the Angels in that Rice Lake Glacius trade, and the numbers are actually really good for Jesse Chavez this year. 2.66 ERA, 1.27 whip, 10K per nine. What do you think? I think it's possible. I think it's possible. I don't know that he's particularly better or worse than uh, than Ryan Tapera, but yeah, I, I may have spoke too confidently about Tapera's chances of stepping into that role first. It may be more of a a mix and match situation there too. Yeah, I was right there with you. I mean, my first thought was instantly Tapera has been the eighth inning guy. He should kind of work his way into that role. But, you know, Chavez has some experience and he's pitching well. So uh, I guess there's a possibility. We'll see uh, if they have any save opportunities later on in the week. This one, Scott, was kind of head scratching from a real life baseball perspective. Jordan Montgomery traded to the St. Louis Cardinals in exchange for Harrison Bader and a player to be named later. And yeah. You know, we talk about Montgomery here, there, solid pitcher, 369 ERA, 1.10 whip, really good swinging strike rate, hasn't really turned into many strikeouts so far this season. Uh, but just kind of a curious move for the Yankees. I guess Domingo Herman will yeah. remain in the rotation for now. Uh, but in general, what do you think about this move for Montgomery now going to the National League? I mean, pitching in a smaller park can only help him. And maybe you know, he's, he's somebody we've talked about before. The swinging strike rates are, are nothing short of elite for Jordan Montgomery. So why isn't he a bigger strikeout guy? And it, maybe the Cardinals will be able to tweak his arsenal so that he becomes that. But even if he doesn't, I mean, he, I think he's a perfectly satisfactory pitcher in fantasy, kind of a seventh, sixth, seventh guy for your pitching staff. We're talking about a 12-team league. And uh, I think he's perfectly fine. It, it was curious the Yankees decided to do this. At the time, there was talk, oh, maybe they're acquiring Pablo Lopez. And that's why they're doing this. But that ultimately didn't happen. So they went out and got Frankie Montas, presumably, so they wouldn't have to rely on Domingo Herman in their rotation. And then it turns out they're going to have to rely on Domingo Herman anyway, because we're not seeing Luis Severino back anytime soon. And, you know, Harrison, he's an asset himself. Harrison Bader, I should say. First name Harrison, not last name. Uh, he's an asset himself. He's a good defensive center fielder. That's a spot that's that's been kind of a trouble spin some spot for the Yankees the past couple of years. They've played Aaron Judge there a lot, which probably isn't ideal. But Bader's also sidelined with plantar fasciitis. I think he just got put in a walking boot mm -hmm. last week after already missing a month. So I don't know. Of course, in fantasy, we like Bader for the stolen bases, but I don't know how soon we'll see him contribute. Yeah, so the most recent update I saw for Bader is that he's going to be shut down for the next two weeks. And the hope is that he will return before the end of the season. He's under team control through next year as well. So it seems like the Yankees do have a uh, defensive minded center fielder and a speedy option for center field next year. Um, but I'm not sure how much he will contribute this year. Again, for those in AL NL only, we have two players switching leagues here. So uh, Montgomery going to NL only if you need pitching there empty the bag for him. Uh, Harrison Bader, if he needs steals, you know, maybe he comes back, but uh, I, I feel pretty skeptical about how much he will contribute the rest of this season. David Robertson was traded to the Phillies for right-handed pitcher Ben Brown. And I think the biggest question here, Scott, is who closes for the Phillies? I assume it's going to be Robertson. He's the one who's more experienced in the role. He's had a great season. And, you know, the Phillies have seemed reluctant to turn that job fully over to Sir Anthony Dominguez anyway, having him split chances with Brad Hand. It seemed like maybe they were kind of starting to come around to the idea, okay, Dominguez is just our closer. But, you know, I, I think if you if you acquire the veteran who seems just as capable and you don't have to worry about a bunch of saves, 
bringing up Dominguez's arbitration cost. You're probably just going to go with Robertson. That's my guess. It's not, you know, I, I say it with maybe 75, 80% confidence that Robertson is just the Phillies closer now. And some Anthony Dominguez is, uh, his stock's about to take a hit. So would you be okay dropping Dominguez for Felix Bautista if he were available? I think if that's what you have to do, I think, yeah, I would. You know, of course, I'd prefer to just hang on to Dominguez until we have more assurances one way or the other. But, yeah, I feel more confident in, in, uh, in Felix Bautista getting saves right now than I do Sir Anthony Dominguez. All right. Next one up. Noah Syndergaard was traded to the Phillies for outfielder Mickey Moniak and another outfielder, uh, JDL, JDL Sanchez. And I, I don't think this is like a huge move. Obviously, Scott Syndergaard, more of a streamer at this point, and he's yeah. going to a tougher ballpark and a tougher division in terms of lineups around him. Yes. And so there's nothing but bad news here for, well, I shouldn't say that. It's mostly bad news for Syndergaard. 517 ERA at home compared to, I'm sorry, 296 ERA at home compared to 517 on the road. And Philly's park is, you know, that that's not a great park for pitchers to begin with. It's He's already been kind of lucky to have the 383 ERA that he does. He's got a 427 X fit, a 425 X ERA. And I think he's going to come closer to those numbers in Philly. The one silver lining is that now he's in a five-man rotation after being stuck in a six-man rotation all year. So we ho we'll hopefully get a couple of two-start weeks out of Cindergard now when maybe we wouldn't have otherwise. All right. In NL only, Scott, let's say, obviously, Noah Cindergard and Jordan Montgomery both become available. We're taking Montgomery over Cindergard. Yes. All right. Luke Voigt, you mentioned this. He was actually part of the Juan Soto trade that... Uh, happened earlier in the day. So Luke Voigt headed to the Washington Nationals where he should play every day, but it goes without saying the lineup is just terrible. And you know, <laughs> first base is such a deep position this year too. And names that we've talked about recently with like Jose Miranda has first base eligibility. Trey Mancini uh, has seen his value go up. And, you know, even someone like Nathaniel Lowe, I would take all of those players over Luke Voigt if you were deciding. And speaking of the Nationals, CJ Abrams, they confirmed Scott will start at triple a with his new team. So you know, yeah, kind, makes of, sense. kind of throw some cold water on, on adding him right now. Yeah. And he could use more development. So that's probably the right move for the nationals. Uh, yeah. It's, it's kind of funny. I mean, that, that one Soto trade, one of the biggest trades ever, but the fantasy implications of it are pretty close to zero, right? If, if, if McKenzie Gore's hurt and CJ Abrams is going to be in the minors. Yeah. It's, just, it's just kind of funny how that works. <laughs> Again, yeah, you're right. It's like the biggest trade in MLB history, but um, obviously it's more so for, for Dynasty Leagues, I would say, as of now, uh, rather than anything else. Eric Hosmer, second baseman Max Ferguson, and outfielder Corey Rozier were traded to the Boston Red Sox in exchange for left-handed pitcher Jay Groom, who was once regarded as a top pitching prospect, uh, but has not pitched well. And just an interesting deal, Scott, because Hosmer has three more years of team control. He's now on the Red Sox, and they have a first base prospect seemingly on the way in Tristan Casas. So I, this was this whole move is just kind of weird. Yeah, I feel like the Red Sox were trying to have their cake and eat it too, doing a little bit of selling, a little bit of buying. They're kind of tweeners right now for a playoff spot. I think there's a a non-zero chance that Hosmer can resuscitate a little bit of fantasy value with the Red Sox. You know, Fenway Park with its weird configuration has made for some for some uh, unlikely success stories in the past. And Hosmer in his career at Fenway Park has hit 354, uh, three home runs and an 889 OPS. Obviously not a huge sample size, but you know, you don't have to hit a fly ball very far into left field for it to be an automatic hit because it bounces off the green monster. And so maybe, maybe Hosmer could see enough of a Babbitt boost that uh, obviously big outfield and left field. So that helps with the Babbitt too. Uh, maybe you could see enough of a Babbitt boost that he's, you know, a, fr a fringy contributor again. 
All right. Next up, Joey Gallo was traded to the Dodgers for a pitching prospect named Clayton Beater. And Gallo looks like he could start in left field against uh, right-handed pitching. But there are reports, Scott, that top prospect Miguel Vargas is being promoted and joining mm -hmm. the Dodgers here on Tuesday night. So not exactly sure how all the playing time is going to work out, but uh, obviously <laughs> maybe the Dodgers can kind of resuscitate some of Joey Gallo's value here. And Oh, they're uh, going to turn him into an MVP candidate for sure. I, I, yeah, it's like no doubt in my mind. A Andrew Friedman suckered the Padres into trading their whole farm system for Juan Soto, <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, Joey Gallo for nothing. Five-win <laughs> player. Man, you know, speaking of Gallo, there there was a story that came out on Tuesday, and it was like an interview asking him about his struggles and you know, just how he's kind of been coping with everything. It, it was actually pretty sad, man. He's like, I don't leave the house in Manhattan. He's like, people kind of just bother me everywhere I go. It's hmm. it's pretty sad, but in general, look, I hope he gets back on his feet. I hope the Dodgers can turn Joey Gallo ar around. But uh, what do you think about him and uh, Miguel Vargas getting called up by the Dodgers? I mean, I'd I'd like to throw a a ticker tape parade for Vargas. I don't know if anybody throws that kind of parade anymore. I'd like to be excited about it, you know, but uh, I don't know if it's just a one day thing. Like if, okay, there's a, we have a roster spot to fill because Joey Gallo hasn't actually joined the team yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. Vargas is available. We can put him on the 40 man roster now. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I think we're going to need a week to see how this is going to play out. How much do the Dodgers really want Joey Gallo playing even as bad as he's been? Is he more of a reclamation project that they're just going to keep around and work with uh, and, and, you know, maybe set their sights on him being a, a big help in 2023? I don't know. Are, are they ready to send Max Muncy to the bench? Because that's the only way I think, well, well whether it's Max Muncy or Justin Turner, that's the only way I think Justin Vargas or, um, uh, What's his first name? Miguel. Miguel Vargas. That's the only way I think he gets consistent playing time. So I don't know. A lot needs to be sorted out here still. I, I think Miguel Vargas has been the best prospect to stash basically since Vinny Pasquantino got called up. If you need third base help, I think it's even a, an even better idea to have him stash now that he could be here to stay. But I don't think we should be counting on him to be the as being the answer to all our prayers just yet. All right. What else do we have here? Relief pitchers Anthony Bass and Zach Pop were traded to the Blue Jays in exchange for shortstop prospect Jordan Groshans, someone who I know you had on your your dynasty team for a while, Scott. Uh, do you have any insights on Jordan Groshans? Oh, he's been a big disappointment this year. Stock down prospect had been a consensus top three, uh, top one hundred guy three years in a row, but I believe he only has one home run this year. At last look, let me see if he had another one recently. So the Marlins were looking to buy low here on a player who earned good marks prior to this year. I, the biggest takeaway for fantasy is just that Anthony Bass isn't going to be taking Tanner Scott's job anytime soon like we were worried about because now he's with the Blue Jays. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, what else? The Cubs did not trade Wilson Contreras. Like, you know, Scott, if you asked me who's the one player most likely to be traded at the deadline, I would have told you Wilson Contreras. And uh, alas, he is not traded here. Well, he, he and Ian Happ got a big send-off at Wrigley Field yeah. over the weekend. And and yeah, no, they're kind of awkward that they're coming back, coming back with their tail between their legs. <laughs> I Look, I guess the Mets didn't want to pony up, but it's just kind of weird it, because... The Mets had a very clear need at catcher, you know, like they could have used Wilson Contreras. A lot of teams could use Wilson Contreras, but uh, the, the the leverage for a seller at the trade deadline is still that that qualifying offer and the compensation pick attached to it. But it, I nonetheless, I find it hard to believe that the the Cubs couldn't get more than what amounts to a compensation pick back from another team for who who's arguably been the player who's arguably been the 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 best catcher in baseball this year like no contender needs a catcher upgrade that's just that's just bizarre to me yeah i don't know, look i guess maybe they just didn't get the offer that they were looking for ian hap of course is under team control through next season as well with the uh chicago cubs so 
Maybe not this year, maybe the offseason, maybe next trade deadline. Who knows? Some lesser deals from the day. Darren Ruff was traded to the Mets for J.D. Davis, a pitcher, Thomas Japucky, another pitcher, Nick Zwack, and another pitcher, Carson Seymour. Three pitchers and J.D. Davis for Darren Ruff. A kind of curious deal. Brandon Marsh was traded to the Phillies for catcher prospect Logan Ohapi, uh, someone I've heard the Welsh uh, talk glowingly about. Apparently, he had a very strong Arizona Fall League last year. Michael <laughs> Fulmer was traded to the Twins. Outfielder Brett Phillips was traded to the Orioles. Jake Lamb to the Mariners. Trevor Rosenthal to the Brewers. Scott, anything you'd like to add on those kind of ancillary deals throughout the day? I think the most interesting one is that Brandon Marsh for Logan Ohapi deal because I mean, Brandon Marsh was a high end prospect for the angels just last year. So it kind of tells you how disappointed they've been with his first full season. Strikeout rate has kept him from hitting for average. The power hasn't manifested like they hoped. So the Phillies were willing to get him to kind of, uh, take care of their center field problem that, that they've had for a while now. And if nothing else, Brandon Marsh can play good defense out there. And then Logan Ohapi, you know, he at double A this year, he slashed 269, 385, so good on base skills, 492 slug, 15 homers in 74 games. He's been kind of a breakout prospect this year. Uh, probably going to be a consensus top 100 guy next year and maybe take over behind the plate for the Angels next summer at some point. So, you know, just not, just not the usual buyer-seller situation with this deal. More of a meeting the needs kind of trade, which is refreshing to see. Mm -hmm. I do think it helps keep Joe Adele around for the angels the rest of the season. So no more excuses. I think the playing time will be there. Even if trout returns, they throw trout in center. They keep Joe Adele in one of the corners and look sink or swim. You have your opportunity final two months. Let's see if Joe Adele can get going and hopefully uh, build things up heading into next season as well. There you go. All of the trades. We're going to wrap there for Scott. I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching this bonus edition of Fantasy Baseball today. We will be back again later on to recap all of Tuesday's action. Bye-bye.